Well, turn in your Bibles, please, to John chapter 2. We started this section of Scripture last week entitled, Deity on Display. In verse 18, the Jews said to Jesus, What sign do you show us for doing these things? Now remember, this question comes right after Jesus walked into the temple at the high point of the Passover and saw all of the street vendors uh, who had turned the temple into a kind of a flea market and threw them all out. That would be like walking into the Rogers Center Game 7 of the World Series and throwing out all of the hot dog vendors, all of the popcorn vendors, all of the drink vendors. And Jesus has just caused a scandal. Uh, what he did in the temple that day was an outrage. But what's remarkable is that Jesus was able to control hundreds, if not thousands, of people, a mass crowd, with only a piece of cord, not a semi-automatic uh, machine gun, not a Semtex explosive vest, just a cord. And it was an amazing display of Jesus' sovereign power to control massive crowds of people. And that got the Jewish people's attention and they said, what sign do you show us for doing these things? In other words, where did you get this authority from? In other words, who are you? Well, that's a $64,000 question. That's the most important question in the world, as a matter of fact. Where did Jesus get his authority from? Because make no mistake, he exercised sovereign authority. And we're going to see three evidences of that in this section here. The first one, as we said, we looked at last week. He has the authority to control massive numbers of people. And that's as far as we got last week. So here's the second evidence, the second proof of his authority. Number two, he knows everything. Look at verse 19. Jesus answered them, destroy this temple, and in three days I will raise it up. Now, the Jews understandably think that Jesus is talking about the physical temple, the temple that they're standing in, the, the, the stones, the bricks, the mortar, destroy this temple. And they also think that it's a threat, that he's going to destroy it. But here's the thing, he wasn't talking about the physical temple, the stone temple, as you'll see clearly in a moment. So they think that this is a terrorist attack. Like, I'm going to level the Rogers Center. Now, if they had social media in those days, uh, we would say that that quote went viral. It, it would have been tweeted and retweeted until everybody in the city has been informed that Jesus has threatened to destroy the temple. That was like saying the word bomb in an airport security line. So how do we know that it went viral? Well, because three years later, when Jesus is on trial, the witnesses say this, quote, We heard him say, I will destroy this temple made with hands, and in three days I'll build another made without hands. Now that's not what Jesus said. That, that's like a version of the kid's um, little game, Broken Telephone. It's a misrepresentation of what Jesus actually said. But in any event, clearly what Jesus said at the beginning of his ministry in John chapter 2 is still in their heads three years later. So it went viral all over the city. And on top of that, when Jesus is hanging on the cross between two robbers and they're hurling insults at him in Matthew chapter 27, verse 39, it says, you who are going to destroy the temple, that's the robber on the cross saying that, and rebuild it in three days, save yourself. See, these words that Jesus said three years earlier have gone so viral that they've penetrated even the underworld. Everybody's heard them, even the riffraff. So Jesus says, destroy this temple, and in three days I will raise it up. Now look at verse 20. The Jews then said, it has taken 46 years to build this temple. And will you raise it up in three days? Well, that's ridiculous. They're thinking, how could anybody build a temple like this in three days? I mean, this particular temple project has been going on for 46 years, and it's still not finished. 
This construction project has been the project that never ends for the last 46 years. It's a money pit. And now after all of this time, maybe when everybody's hoping that it's almost done, they think Jesus has threatened to bulldoze it and rebuild it again in three days. But Jesus was not talking about the physical temple. Verse 21, Jesus was speaking about the temple of his body. Jesus is letting them know that he knows when he's going to die and what's going to happen to him when he dies. Jesus is talking about something a lot more outrageous than building a temple in three days. He's talking about coming back from the dead in three days. That's the second proof of Jesus' authority. He knows everything. He controls mass crowds of people with just the sound of his voice and a whip in his hand, and secondly, he knows everything. He knew before he died that he was going to die. He knew exactly when he was going to die. He knew exactly the precise hour on the precise day that he was going to die, the same moment when thousands of Passover lambs were being slaughtered in the temple. He knew that he was going to die at that exact same moment. He knew how he was going to die. He said, I will be lifted up the way crucifixion victims are lifted up off the ground. He knew at whose hands he was going to die, and he knew what was going to happen to him after he died. He would come back to life again after three days. He knew all of that before any of it happened. One of the most fantastic verses in the Bible is John chapter 10, verse 18, where Jesus says, Nobody can take my life from me. I sacrifice it voluntarily, for I have the authority to lay down my life when I want to, and also to take it up again. Nobody could ever say that before, and what do you know? That's exactly what happened, the way Jesus said it would happen. If somebody knows exactly when they're going to die, and how they're going to die, and at whose hands they're going to die, and how long they're going to be dead, and then publicly declare all of that information before any of it happens, well, only God could do that. Look at verse 22. When, therefore, he was raised from the dead, his disciples remembered that he had said this, and they believed the scripture, and the word that Jesus had spoken. See, when you understand that Jesus knows everything, that strengthens your faith in the scripture and in Jesus. Same thing, by the way. Believing the words of Jesus and believing the words of scripture, same thing. He controls massive crowds of people with just the sound of his voice and a whip. And second, he knows everything. That's how we know that Jesus is God in a human body. In John chapter 21, Jesus confronts Peter in verse 15 of John 21. And he says to Peter, do you love me? And Peter says, yes, Lord, you know that I love you. Notice, you know that I love you. Because you see, Peter, of course, cannot say, of course I love you. He can't say, here's the evidence of my love for you. He cannot say, I've proved that I love you. When you were on trial, I stood up for you. I stayed with you. I was in your corner. I was faithful. Peter cannot say that because he didn't. Peter doesn't really have a lot to offer right here in John 21 in the way of proof that he loves Jesus. I mean, he had adamantly promised Jesus right before the crucifixion that he would always have Jesus back. That even if everybody else abandoned him, Peter says, I will never abandon you. And yet, when the rubber hits the road and he's standing before a little charcoal fire while Jesus is on trial for his life, a little servant girl comes up to Peter, points him out as a follower of Christ, and Peter swears and denies Jesus. So when the chips were down, Peter was a coward. And that movie is playing like a relentless nightmare in Peter's mind. 
This was the Super Bowl of tests. If ever there was a time to stand up and declare allegiance to Christ, that was it. And he blew it. And so Jesus comes to Peter in his torture in John 21 and says, Do you love me? Interestingly, in John 21, it says, Jesus built a charcoal fire on the beach. And sitting around that little charcoal fire, he says to Peter, Do you love me? It was around a charcoal fire when Peter denied. It was around a charcoal fire when Jesus says, Do you love me? The only two times in Scripture, charcoal fire is mentioned. And Peter says, You know, you know, you know that I love you. Here's what he means. I know what looks like I don't love you. I know what looks like I did not love you. But you know that I do. That's all he's got. That's all he can pin his hopes on. The omniscience, the all-knowing nature of the Lord Jesus Christ. He's trusting that Christ knows his heart, even though he blew it. So Christ says to him a second time, do you love me? Same question. Peter says again, same answer. Yes, Lord, you know that I love you. Jesus says to him again, do you love me? Three times for three denials. Verse 17. Then he says, you know all things. You know that I love you. And Jesus says, feed my sheep. Here's what Jesus means. I know that you love me. Now, forget about the past and go out and prove that you love me. What an amazing lesson. Sometimes all we need to change is to know that somebody believes in us. You see, it's not your future, it's your past. It's, sorry, it's your future, not your past, that matters. Maybe you've made some mistakes, some blunders, not many successes, maybe only tries and failures, pledges and broken promises, regrets rather than rewards. Maybe you've been misunderstood, judged. That was Peter. And you're thinking, but I do love Christ. I just don't have an awful lot to back it up. You don't need to prove to anybody that you love Christ. You just have to know that He knows that you love Him. Now go out and prove it. Jesus says to you, I know that you love me. I know your heart. I know your hurt. I know your intents. I know your fears. I, I know your insecurities. Now stop feeling sorry for yourself. And get out there and prove that you love me. Sometimes all we need in order to change is to know that somebody believes in us. I mean, if you met somebody who could control crowds the way Jesus did, with just the sound of his voice and a cord in his hand, and who knew everything about everything, including the exact moment and the exact nature of his own death and how long he would be dead, and then things turned out exactly the way he said, wouldn't that get your attention? See, that's the authority that Jesus has. All we can do is bow in the presence of such supreme authority and power and then worship him and love him and obey his commands and come to the communion table and remember his death and remember how much he loves us. Heavenly Father, we thank you for this precious time in your word this morning. Lord, we pray for those here today who do not know Christ. 
Lord, would you please show them through your marvelous Holy Spirit that Christ is God in a human body. Help them to believe and to trust you. Father, for the rest of us, strengthen our faith, increase our resolve to love Christ, and to honor and to exalt and to worship and to obey him. Lord, may we walk worthy of you because you are worthy. May we say with the Apostle Paul, we make it our aim to please Christ. Amen.